Hello friends, I'm Heather Morjo. I am feeling a little silly right now because I thought I was doing a TV interview this morning, but it was a radio interview. So I got all dressed up, I did my hair, I did my makeup, I put on my dress, and then I was on the radio. <laughs> so I, I just, but it got me in a talking mood. And so I just wanted to share some thoughts about public art. Um, as many of you know, I just installed Goose Garden which is a larger than life, whimsical statue garden floating in the middle of the lagoon at Prince's Island Park in Calgary. And it's been a three year journey to bring it to where it is today. And I love the feedback that I'm getting about it. Um, not because it's all good, but because it's important to have conversations around public art, right? Um, there's been comments on Facebook mostly that range everywhere from this is one of the top three art installations in Calgary to this is a waste of money and it's worse than the blue ring, right? And that is important <clears throat> for us to talk about because I've lived in a city where the majority of the infrastructure was drab gray rectangles. And when you would walk down the street, there was very little in the way of sculpture or murals. <clears throat> the majority of the art was reserved as pay to play, right? You would go into a gallery, you would pay to get into the gallery and you would see the art there and that's it. And it was not a great place to live. And it's still not a great place to live. And I have lived in Calgary, I've lived in many places across Canada, and Calgary's art scene is really important, right? And what I think happens is the average Calgarian in their daily commute, downtown Calgary, hypothetically walking from Hillhurst to the downtown core, passes so many pieces of art every day that they don't even realize that it's there. It's just a part of the background to them. The infrastructure, the architecture, the sculpture, the power boxes that have artwork, vinyl applique onto them, the murals, all of these things are an important part of what makes a city vibrant and beautiful. And it means a lot that I get to be a little part of that for a couple months with my Goose Garden installation, right? That those people doing that walk downtown have to go across a bridge and potentially see my artwork if they're not looking at their phone. And my artwork is a conversation that I wanted to have about the home of the goose. Right. So the goose has been in this area in Mokinsis since before Calgary was even a city, right? Since long ago, indigenous peoples would even set their calendars by the migration of geese because it was such an important part of what their daily lives entailed. And the the indigenous worldview of relationships to the land and to animals is one of recognizing that we are all related. All of my relations is what we say. And so this is in stark contrast to the uh, Eurocentric Judeo-Christian colonial mindset, which says, we are humans are above animals and that nature is here to serve us and um, be exploited to our needs. So this conversation is asking people to consider, you know, if, if the goose is your relation, if the goose is your cousin and Princess Island Park is your cousin's home where she raises her children, how does that change the conversation? How does that change your perception of how you interact with the space, how you interact with the goose, 
how you impact the environment, right? How would you conduct yourself in your cousin's home? And this conversation is, um, you know, one I had with the sculpture as I was creating it, with elders as I was creating it, you know, passing those teachings of reminding us that, you know, this animal is in relationship with us, right? And a lot of people don't see that. They're like, well, what what do you mean, right? Like, and, and you have to break it down to a micro level to understand the macro impact, right? So the migration of the goose impacts our awareness of the seasons. We know spring is here when the goose arrives. While it's here, it is eating grass and weeds and, and different plant material by the water. And it is defecating in the water, which is creating nitro nitrogen um, fertilizer for the water plants. The water plant that I selected for Goose Garden is bulrush cattails this plant is a powerhouse when it comes to removing toxins from waters including arsenic and it is nourished by the goose waste and then cattails in a traditional sense was a medicine was a food was a weaving material this is a, a powerhouse plant that had a lot of beneficial uses to the indigenous peoples prior to colonization and now today it's used in reclamation specifically of areas that have been damaged by tailing ponds, extraction of resources, leaching of set of chemicals into uh, groundwater and uh, has a benefit to us in that sense, right? So we're in relationship with the goose, whether we realize it or not. And what this sculpture, what I'm hoping it will do is ask us to realize it to see the ways in which we are in relationship with nature. Uh, you know, and some people won't ever have that conversation with themselves, specifically not when they're like just looking at a giant rubber duck, as someone called it online, um, sitting in the pond. They're, they're just gonna see a waste of taxpayers' money and not see a value to it and not understand that there is a larger conversation that the artist is trying to have with the community, with the, the animal community, with the goose people as well. Um, when I was installing it, I let them know, like I'm doing this to honor you, to celebrate you. Because part of my recovery journey in Calgary involved going down to Princess Island Park in the spring and seeing the goslings and seeing that new life, that, that beauty of a new generation coming forward every year right and that generation would grow from a yellow fluffy duck to a majestic Canadian goose Canada goose and <laughs> that was another criticism as I kept calling it a Canadian goose and it's a Canada goose um, and then they would grow their flight feathers and learn to migrate down to the southern states right and that that's an important message to me about my growth and my evolution as a as a person as a human so you know there is people who are just gonna say like that's that's a waste of taxpayers money why are we even looking at this thing you know it's just a ridiculous floating plastic sculpture and they're not going to look further than that and some people don't want to look further than that right because they envision art as something that should be commodified right if i wanted to see art i would go to a gallery and pay to get in and once i get in there i would pay to see the things that i want to see and i am doing public art specifically because i do not believe that's real i believe that art is for the public and the most important art pieces are the ones that are free and available to everyone, right? Um, when we have this elitism behind art where you can only purchase it in order to enjoy it, it 
in my mind, like in the capitalist mind, it increases its value. A one of a kind piece of artwork created by somebody who is renowned will have a higher price tag and yield a bigger investment over time than a mass produced print, right? And so the, the argument that I have is based in the indigenous worldview um, in the gift economy. So once upon a time, um, co colonizers, settlers came to North America and were given gifts by the indigenous people. And indigenous people would give gifts with the understanding that those gifts would be passed on. And the giving of those gifts would increase the connections within the community and the relationships. And the settlers, on the other hand, came with the European worldview that gifts are a commodity which must be kept and hoarded and accumulated in order to demonstrate wealth. Meanwhile, Indigenous people, wealth is demonstrated by who gives away the most. And so uh, the Indigenous person gave a gift and then went to the home of the settler and saw the gift still sitting there years later and said, when are you going to pass that on? When are you going give to that, give that away again? And the settler did not understand this. And so hence the slur Indian giver was born. And so public art, and, and then we can talk about art as an indigenous um, industry, um, practice as well. And, and I went to this amazing panel and I, I had, uh, all I remember is it was a, a variety of actors and the only one I really knew was Jean Braverock. And the discussion was about indigenous arts and an elder stood up and I didn't catch the elder's name, but he had a really important message about how in traditional times, art was revered in such a way that if a family needed an artist to say, construct moccasins or make regalia or weave a basket for a, a special purpose, that family would essentially adopt that artist for the period of time that they were creating and make sure that they had all the food and shelter and everything that they needed during the period of time that they were creating. And it was because they were giving the gift of their talents to that family for that family's benefit that they were more than happy to give everything that they had in order to support them. And whereas the colonial approach is that the artist struggles, often in poverty, um, uh, until they reach a level of being revered, if they reach a level of being revered within their lifetime where they can make enough money to survive. And the artist created in isolation uh, without support. Now this is changing a little bit with the granting system where a body of uh, a jury of people will decide if a project is worth investing in and a investment will be made in that project so that the artist is supported during the period of time that they are creating that project, which is great, right? Uh, and I believe that the next evolution, it will be universal basic income, which is a necessity as we are moving into the uh, age of automation where uh, the majority of jobs will be passed on to AI and different types of technology and we will be looking at an economy that is no longer sustainable by the ways that it would, has been through labor force. So the, the you know, I, I'm hoping we're going to see the end of the church, the form of capitalism that we're currently living in and instead move into something a little more evolved and that inf includes universal basic income 
universal basic income is a basic living expense equal to the cost of living for the region that they're in where a uh, human is provided all the basic necessities of life and the opportunity there is that people who are artists who are creatives will be supported in their process of creativity and it also on a larger conversation alleviates poverty currently poverty is extremely expensive a, a unhoused person uses more resources than a housed person um, for emergency services food banks all of these things it's cheaper to put them in a home and give them the basic necessities than it is to leave them rough on the streets and when we remove those constraints of poverty we also alleviate many of the issues of mental health struggles and um, addiction struggles that people turn to as a result of living in poverty right a lot there are people who use drugs on the street just because they don't have anything to eat and the drugs make it easier for them to be hungry there are people who use drugs because they can't access pharmaceuticals because we don't have basic pharma care and those pharmaceuticals would be psychiatric drugs that would help them with their mental health so they turn to the drugs because they're more easily accessible than pharmaceuticals so universal basic income would alleviate those problems and ensure that artists have an opportunity to create in a way that is meaningful and has a broader impact right and perhaps when that occurs people will see the value of time and energy and talent and education and vision that go into the expression of creative arts uh, public arts architecture sculpture um, all of these things become a bigger uh, people have more room to be aware of it because they're not hyper focused on their basic needs and where their tax dollars are going um, to the same degree because the the narrative of scarcity is not necessarily going to be as dominant in the capitalist culture as it is today um I want, I, and i just want to close with where i want to go with my career because i'm starting to get like a, a clearer vision of where i want to go um you know a lot of people have criticized me because i, I don't go to markets right my mental health is such that markets are not easy for me and so for me to my art is slow right it's it's a slow process of many weeks of creating before a piece is finished it's in the case of goose garden years and so i don't have a stock to sell in a market to maintain my livelihood right and so a lot of people said well what do you want with your art career i want to be a large-scale public artist that travels the world and installs sculpture and creates architecture designs for the benefit of all the people who live there that would be a dream that would be a, an end goal that i could definitely feel really confident about right and I'm, I'm starting i'm just starting to feel a little bit of a sense of pride about my art career you know and uh where i've where i've come so far you know and i always try and go 10 steps ahead where am i going to get to what's the end goal and i feel like that's the direction that i want to continue to move towards uh i'm not going to be able to do that without an agent i really wish there was an indigenous art agent out there that would take me on. Who would take anybody on? 
there's so many talented artists and we're just like all floundering as solopreneurs trying to catch all the calls um the artist calls and write all the grants and it's exhausting and do the books and and do the advertising do the marketing and it's exhausting and i you know hope to see a day where we can all come together in a cooperative approach rather than a single owner approach and be able to share our artwork together and profit together from it um, I just don't have the capacity to create a platform to do that yet um, but yeah as an artist public art large-scale sculptures you know and and I, I have a few um, white male artists who I you know side eye and I'm like ah oh, that's what I want to be and I hate you because you are what I want to be you know but at the same time I might not be able to conceptualize my vision for my future if it weren't for their already existing careers and so like what does that look like so I would need a team I would need like the biggest hurdle that I faced with Goose Garden was engineering I didn't have an engineer in my back pocket that could uh, clearly identify the structural integrity of the dome of fiberglass on the back of the goose to ensure that it could have a load bearing capacity that would be equal to a person climbing on it were they to swim out into the middle of the lagoon and climb up on the goose for the liability protection of the city right and I would not have been able to overcome that if it wasn't for Julie who works with the city finding an architect pardon me an engineer that was willing to assess my sculpture and uh, that was great but I mean I need to have an engineer in my back pocket who can look at my designs and and say yep here you go this this one is good this needs to be tweaked here's your angles here's your Here's the things that the, the the minute details that are going to ensure the structural integrity of the sculpture and safety for anyone who might attempt to climb it or whatever. Um, and then, you know, I'm very fortunate. My father is a draftsman. So when I have conceptualized something, my sketch 2D, you know, I could do orthographic projections, which is like top, side, bottom, right? And then the three-dimensional angles. But in order to actually do the three-dimensional drawings, I need him because he's actually trained in AutoCAD. And I'm so focused on what I do already. I don't have the capacity to re-educate myself in a whole new format of design in order to do what I do, right? So I'm very fortunate that I'm able to create my images, send them to him. He's able to take them into AutoCAD and create a rendering. Um, you know, one day I hope to employ my lo my little brother, Matthew, who is an animator and have him animate that three-dimensional rendering. Um, but the reality is what I do need is people who are skilled in metalworking, concrete, um, earth moving sculpture casting um, molds and reliefs and forge forge casting right um, I need 3D printers I need all of these massive skill sets and I cannot do it on my own I can conceptualize the idea right like I have a beautiful vision for the memorial in downtown Calgary that would honor the children who lost their lives to residential residential schools I can't build it I don't have the skill set I have connections that might be able to ensure that I can but what I really need is like a team of people that I can draw from their skills and pay them to do it and 
I ha I know some of these people. I know some of these skill sets. What I dream of being able to do is have a team of indigenous artists, um, skilled trades people, um, who I can hire to help me build and construct these things, right? And, you know, my fantasy world, it's like this power team of indigenous two-spirit and women who like come in and, you know, are able to project manage and, and, and run the whole show and run it top to bottom. Um, but I know how hard that is, right? Especially, especially in a climate where sexism and racism are rampant. And I've had to deal with like volatile, violent men who are mad at me because I know what the design should look like and he doesn't understand. And I'm trying to explain it to him and he feels like an idiot. So he takes it out on me by calling me like, oh, here's a super bitch, hear me roar, right? I've had to deal with some tough shit, right? I've, I've had to deal with some amazing men who are very good at what they do and super understanding and forgiving of my little meltdowns and the moments that I get stressed out and cranky and understand that my moments of getting stressed out and cranky um, are no different than a man's moments of stressed out and cranky. It might look different on the surface. Um, it might be tears instead of punching walls, but it's still a valid expression of frustration over tense situations of trying to finish the project on the timeline or um, pour concrete in a torrential downpour, right? And I've had some amazing guys that I've worked with that, that really get it. And I've been burned, right? And the reality is the, the people who have burned me have all been white men. And um, like three in particular walked away with thousands of dollars and left me in a situation where I'm in a lurch or still to this day trying to fix the mistakes that they purposely caused and um, they got paid. I might not have gotten paid for that project. There's a lot of projects that I don't get paid, that I am managing and initiating and um, hiring people to, to fill that skill gap that I don't have and they're doing the work and I'm paying them to do it and some of them just F off and that's, sorry about your luck, you know. Um, I had to call the police on one of them. That's how bad it got once, right? Like, I could, I could give you a laundry list of sob stories. The, the reality is I'm very fortunate to have the teams of people that I have ha had, right? And I've had some incredible people that I've worked with. Um, Sober Crew Calgary, whew, that was that was the best, amazing volunteer team that I've worked with. Foodscape has an incredible team of people behind it. And, you know, every day I, I want to be able to pay them a living wage to be able to do what they do to help support things like Goose Garden coming into reality. Um, so, yeah, that's my vision for the future of my art career. Um, you know, meanwhile, I'm puttering around in my studio, creating things and hoping they turn out. And um, sometimes I get money that supports that to happen. And sometimes I'm just doing it on my own time, on my own dollar and hoping it turns out. And sometimes you don't sell a single one. The, the Frozen Aurora series, I have not sold a single one, right? And it's like, ugh. I worked so hard on that. Why don't people love it? But, I mean, that's art. It's subjective. What I think is beautiful is not what everyone else thinks is beautiful. Maybe people don't want a canvas of 90% black that glows in the dark sometimes when it's exposed to UV on their wall. 
right? Maybe it's a very specific place that needs to have that artwork, like a dark bar, right? Or um, a lounge or something like that. And they just haven't found the artwork yet. Um, I'm just, I'm really excited about having been able to do Goose Garden and just wanted a couple minutes, half an hour apparently, to <laughs> talk about it and share my thoughts and feelings that keep me up at night about it. And um, I, I really do hope that people enjoy it and get to experience seeing it and seeing the geese around it before they fly south again. And yeah, thanks for listening. <laughs>